Today we are remaking the classic breakout game using the Rust programming language. Why? Well, there's a severe lack of Rust tutorials aimed at game development. Someone's gotta do it, so here we go. When this video is over, we'll have balls, ball power-ups, game states, nothing fancy, but a good project to learn some Rust. Let's initialize a Rust project with Cargo. We open up the generated TOML file so we can add the MacroQuad dependency. MacroQuad is one of my favorite game development frameworks for Rust. Here are some games I've made using this library, and we're gonna learn it today. In the main.rs file, we first include MacroQuad's prelude. We also need to change the main function to look like this. The MacroQuad library requires your main function to be async in order to have WebAssembly support. Rust does not support having an async main function out of the box, that is why this macro is needed. Our game needs a loop, and then we're gonna call next frame. This function will submit our render calls to our screen. The next frame function is asynchronous, so we have to await this function. Let's cargo run, because that's all we need to get a window up and running. Let's say we wanna change the background color. Well, before we submit our next frame, we can call clear background and pass in the color white. Now we got a white background. The reason we can just type out white, or clear background, is because they are included in the macro quad prelude. You should always have the documentation on the side in case you need to figure out how to use MacroQuad. The MacroQuad GitHub page also has a bunch of example code. Let's add the player. First I'm gonna add a constant for the player size. It's going to be a 2D vector with a width of 150 and a height of 40. I apologize for introducing const macros this early, I know it looks a bit scary. If you wanna have a const vec2, this is my preferred way to do it. The player is going to be a rectangle, so let's create a player rect. Looking on the rect new function, it takes an x, y, width and height. Let's place our player rect in the middle of the screen. We can do that pretty easily getting the width of the screen and then dividing it by half. Once again you can find this function in the documentation. The y position will just be at the bottom of the screen, so let's grab the screen height and push it up by about 100 floats. The width and height of the player will be, well, the player size we just defined. Now we have a rectangle, let's draw it right after clearing the background white. The draw rectangle function takes an x, y, width, height and then a color. So let's pass in these values from the rect. I'll use the dark grey color, looking good. There is one issue though as you can see, the rectangle is not centered. The center starts at the top left corner of the rectangle. To center it we can subtract half of the width of the player rectangle. To be a bit more organized we're gonna move this rectangle into a player struct. Then let's make a constructor for the player struct. The new function returns an instance of the player struct. And now we can remove this rectangle code into the player struct. Let's make a new player instance. I'm gonna implement a draw function and just like before we call draw rectangle. But this time being a function on a struct that takes a reference to self we need to use self.rect. Now we can call player.draw instead of draw triangle. And oh, I also changed the color to be blue. Why not? Let's implement player controls. Let's add an update function to the player struct. This time it takes a mutable reference to self because we need to change the player rect values to move it. We also receive a delta time floating point value. We'll use this to move the player equally fast regardless of what FPS our game is running. The most common approach to writing input and movement is to create a variable like this and if the left key is down we can subtract from this value. If the right key is down we add to this value. I recommend you to use this version but if you want to get a little bit spicy I'm gonna show you another way to write this which might be a bit overkill but I think it's really cool. I gather the key press booleans into a tuple. We are then going to pattern match this tuple. If the left key boolean is true and the right key is false we'll return minus one. If only the right key boolean is true we return 1 otherwise by default we return 0. The return value of this match will be put into this xmove variable. This does the same thing as the first method I showed you. Use the one that makes sense for you. I'm gonna use the second one because I think it's cool. Let's move the player. We'll add this movement vector multiplied by delta time and then the player speed. Player speed is not a thing yet so let's define a constant. I'll set it to 700. Before we run our application let's quickly add some collision. If the x of the rectangle is less than 0 that means we hit the left wall. To push it back in we'll set the x position to be 0. If the x is higher than the screen width minus the size of the rect that means we are hitting the right wall. Then we do a correction just like before. We don't call this update function yet so let's implement it in the main loop right before we render anything. We need to pass in delta time and we can get that from get frame time. And now we can run our application, we can move the player rect and we have wall collision. Next we're going to add some blocks. 
Let's make a new struct called block. It will have a rect just as before and in our new function we'll pass in a position. We instantiate the rect with the position and then the block size. So let's define a block size. We need a draw function just like the player and that's that. We'll have a bunch of blocks so let's store them in a vector. I will define two variables with an height and you can do that on one single line by using a tuple. This is how many blocks will spawn. Before we spawn the blocks we need a starting position. We need to get this position and start from here and spawn the blocks line by line. Here comes the math. We can get the x position by taking the screen width minus the total size of all of the blocks. So width times the block size. If we then half all of that we get the starting x position. Yay maths! The y position will just be 50 pixels down. That went really fast so you can pause the video right now to take a look on the code. Let's generate the blocks. I'm gonna loop the width times the height. That's how many blocks we need to generate. Here comes the maths again. If we take the index i and mod it with the width, we'll get a looping value going from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, going like that endlessly. That is our x position. The index is of type u size, so we need to convert that into a float. And then we need to multiply this by the block width. The y position is similar to x, but instead of using the modular of the width, we divide the index by the width. We instantiate the block with these positions and add it to the blocks vector. We can then iterate all of the blocks and then draw them. As you can see, it looks like one big rectangle, so we can add some padding to make it look nicer. I'm gonna make a variable called total size. It'll be the block size plus some padding value. Let's set the padding value to 5 pixels, and we can then replace the block size with this total size. Perfect! If we increase the padding, well, this happens. Let's add a ball struct. It is going to have a rect, but the ball will also have a velocity because it is going to move. The new function will take a position. We instantiate the rect with this position and then the ball with an height. Let's make a constant for that. The velocity I'm going to randomize. We can randomize a value using the gen range function. Either the ball will go minus in the x direction or positive in the x direction. The y velocity will be 1, so it will always start by falling down. Randomizing the vec values can mess up the length of the vector, so calling normalize ensures that the length is always 1. Let's add the draw function just like before, and then we're gonna add an update function and pass in the delta time. Every game tick the ball moves in the velocity direction, we need to multiply that by the delta time and then a ball speed. Another constant we need to define. Same goes for the y position. Before we run this, let's implement some collisions. If the x position is less than 0, we touch the left wall. We're just gonna force it to move right, so we set the x of the velocity to be positive. If we touch the right wall, the velocity should be set to negative. We're also gonna add ceiling collision. Here we need to force the y velocity to be positive, so it goes down. Our game will have more than one ball, so let's make a vector of balls. Let's add a ball to the balls vector. I'm gonna set the position to be at the center of the screen. We need to call the update function on the ball, so we're gonna iterate them every game tick and call update using the delta time. Don't forget we need to also draw the balls, so let's implement that. Amazing! To help test our game we're gonna make it so if you tap space we can spawn balls, just as a testing tool. Things are gonna get spicy now, we're gonna implement ball versus block collision. I'm gonna make a utility function for resolving collisions. It will take a mutable reference to a rect, a velocity and the other rect that we are testing if we are colliding with. We'll return a boolean indicating if a collision occurred. The rect struct has a function called intersect. It returns an option of a rect. That may seem weird, but here is how it works. The return value of this function will be the area where they are intersecting. That's why we get an option. We can use if let sum to enter this branch if we get the intersecting rect. You might notice that I dereferenced the b rect. That is because this function does not take a reference to a rect, it takes a owned value of a rect. By dereferencing, an owned copy will instead be passed into this function. For now, I don't care about the intersection area, so by writing underscore, I'm telling the compiler to not warn me that I'm not using this data. If a collision occurs, we will swap the y velocity. We need to return if a collision happens, so let's return true if we enter this statement, otherwise we return false. In Rust, the last statement can be a return value, that is why you're not seeing a return value down here. Before we use this function, let's make it so blocks can be removed. I'm gonna add a 32-bit integer called lives on the block struct. Let's instantiate the lives to 1 in the new function. After updating the velocity of all of the balls, let's implement collision. We iterate every ball, and first we're gonna see if we are colliding with the player rect. We need to pass a mutable reference to the ball's rect, velocity, and then we're gonna check against the player's rect. Just like that, now the balls will collide with the player. As you can see, this behavior isn't perfect, we're going to fix that soon. 
We have ball to player collision, let's implement ball to block collision. For every ball we will also iterate every block. We call result collision and this time we will use the return value to reduce the lives of the block if a collision happened to occur. Now when the lives of a block reaches zero, we want to remove them from the block's vector. We can conveniently do this by using a vector function called retain. This function will look through all of the items of the vector and if the lambda is true, the item will stay. If the lambda is false, they will be removed from this vector. So if the block's lives is above zero, we want to retain them. Look at that! It's almost a game! I'm personally not a fan of how this physics works. Only swapping the y velocity of the ball is a bit odd. I want them to bounce off the x-axis also. That is easier said than done, but we're going to do it. We're gonna implement AABB collision. Grab your notes because this is going to be fairly math heavy. Assume the ball is wrecked A and the block is wrecked B. How should the collision of the ball be resolved? Well, visually we can see that the ball should be pushed out of B in the direction of this green line. By observing the intersection area, we can figure out that when the width is smaller than the height, that means we should push it in the x direction. And when the height is smaller than the width, we should push it on the y axis. But how do we know which direction we should push it in? Well, if we draw a vector from B to A, we can see that this arrow is pointing in the negative x direction. Let's put it into code. First we need A and B's center positions. Direct unfortunately doesn't have a function that gives us the center, so we have to calculate the center using the point and size function. Wait a minute, instead of complaining that they don't have this function, why don't I go ahead and implement it myself? Let's make a bunch of macro crowd write the code, commit and then make a pull request. Oh my god! Wow! Okay, he actually merged my change, so in the future macrocod version, you can just type rect.center. Very cool. We then get the B to A arrow. I convert this arrow to be in a signum. This will convert the direction to the axis that the direction is pointing towards. We then check if the width is higher than the height intersection to figure out if we're pushing in the x or y direction. If the width is higher than the height, we move it on the y direction. And where do we move it? Well, we can take the signum, the axis where it's pointing towards, reverse it and then push it down with the intersection width. The y velocity will be forced to be the reverse of the axis, but we'll use the same velocity value. We need to absolute that in case the velocity is negative. We do the same thing for x. I understand that the maths can be a bit confusing, so I recommend you to write it down on a piece of paper or something. And uh, now if we run our application, collision works so much better. We can actually make this code a little bit more readable. Notice how all of the code is indented. Well, here's a trick how to reduce the indentation. Instead, we're going to match the result of the intersection function. If we get some intersection, we return it into this variable. If there's no intersection, we return false. The return false will actually return out of this function. And now we can remove this indentation. Let's change the block starting lives to be 2. We're gonna color the blocks based on how many lives it has. We can do that by pattern matching the lives value. If it's 2, we return the color red. Otherwise, by default, we're gonna return orange. Don't forget to pass this color into the draw rectangle function. Already looks a lot better. Let's implement the score. First I'm gonna add a font that I found online. And to use it with our application, I'm gonna place it in a folder called res. To use the font, we need to load it first. We load it from the rest folder with the file name. This function is async, so we need to await it. And loading the file can fail, so the function returns a result. I'm just gonna unwrap the result. If we can't find the font, the application will just crash. We need a score integer, so let's add it. We can make it so we get a score when the block loses a life. When that happens, we're just gonna add 10 points. Let's render this text to the screen using the draw text x function. <laughs> We need to format the text using the score and we'll put it in the middle of the screen and with a y position of 40. The last argument is the text params and we can now pass in the font that we loaded, set the size and set the color. The text param has a bunch of other things and we don't care about those values, we'll just use the default. As you can see again, the text is not centered. We need to move it back half the width of the text size. And how do you get that? Well, there's a function called measure text. We need to pass in the text, font, size and scale and this function returns how much screen space this text will take. Now we can subtract the x position by half the width. And now it's centered in the middle of the screen. Let's say we only want the score to be added when we remove a block, not when we bounce on a block. To do that we can add a score only when the lives are zero or less. Now we got a score, but what about player lives? Let's add a lives variable. 
and then we're gonna draw it in the upper left corner, just how we rendered text before. When should we lose a life? Well, when the ball passes the player. First we need to implement the removal of balls. As a test, we're going to retain all the balls whose Y position is above the screen height minus 100 pixels. As you can see, the balls are removed. Let's remove these 100 pixels. We want to know when the balls gets removed. And a simple way to do that is to store the length of the balls vector before we call retain. And when we have retained, we get the length again and the differential is how many balls were lost. If more than zero balls were removed, let's reduce the player lives. As you can see, this works, but in breakout, you should only lose lives if it was the last ball that passed the player. If the ball count is one, then it was the last ball. As we can see now, we can miss a bunch of balls unless it's the last one, then we lose the lives. Let's implement game states. We'll make a game state enum that has a menu, game, level completed and dead. The game will start with the menu, so let's instantiate the variable to that. Let's match the game state before we render the score or the lives. If we move all of the text code to only render if we are in the game state, if we run the game now, as you can see, there's no score or lives text. In the menu we're going to render the text press space to start. I place it in the middle of the screen, looking good. We are going to draw similar text in the level completed state or in the dead state. So let's make a function to reuse it. I'll call it draw title text and we pass in the string and the font. Now instead we can just use this function when drawing the menu state. If the level was completed we'll write you win and if you lost we will write you died. To see that it works we can just change the starting state. You win, awesome. You died. Awesome. Let's also move all of the gameplay logic we've written to only run when we are in the game state. Copy all of that, indent it, there we go. If we run the game now, nothing happens to the ball nor the player input. Let's implement tap space to start. When we tap space in the menu state, we'll change the state into the game state. Now we can start the game tapping space. Let's implement the win and lose condition. When we lose the player lives, we're also gonna check if the player died. If the health is zero or less, that will enter the death state. Let's also implement a win condition and that happens when we have removed all of the blocks. AKA the block vec is empty. If that's the case, we change the state to the level completed state. If we want to play the game again, we should be able to tap space. If we are in the level completed stage, tapping space, we're going to change the state back to the menu state. Same goes for dead state. Awesome, we can play the game endlessly, but there's a problem, the state of the board doesn't reset. So let's implement a reset game function. All of these variables will need to reset every game. First, let's reset the player's position. And we're going to be really lazy here by simply reinstantiating the player. Because the player's new function sets the player's position to be in the middle of the screen, let's call this reset function when we leave the game over state. And as you can see, now the player's position gets corrected when we restart the game. Let's reset the player lives and the player score, and also remove all of the balls. To reset the blocks, we need to reinstantiate all of the positions again. Instead of copying this code over to the reset state, I will move this into a reusable function called initBlocks. And this function will need a mutable reference to this block vector. First we clear the blocks, and then we can call the init function. And other blocks should also reset. Don't forget we also need to reset the game if we exit the level completed state. Bam, now we can play the game endlessly. The game resets perfectly. Let's add a block type that once it gets removed, it will spawn another ball. The blocks should have a type, regular or spawn ball on death. Now the constructor will also take a block type. Let's change the color based on the block type. First we will match the block type. If it's a regular block, we will use the red or orange color, or if it's a special block, it will be green. When we instantiate the blocks, we now need to provide the block type. Let's set all of them to be regular. Let's randomize one block to turn into a special block. We can generate a random index. We use this index into the blocks and then we can modify the block type to be this special type. If we want three random blocks to be special, we can simply call this three times, making a for loop. If we run, we can now see that there are three blocks that are green. Let's implement the power up. When a block is destroyed, we can also check the block type to see if it should spawn a ball when it gets destroyed. In order to be able to make comparison checks on enums, our enum need to derive from partial equal. The block gets destroyed, now we should spawn a ball, so we instantiate it and add it to the balls vector. But here comes the rust problem. The compiler will not allow this. 
we are iterating a ball vector and in this iteration we're also trying to add balls to this vector. Rust actually prevents us from potentially creating an endless loop. A simple fix is to instead add this ball into a temporary vector, I'm gonna call it spawn later. And when we are done we will then iterate this spawn later vector and push them into the balls vector. The reason I'm calling into iter instead of iter is because the into iter function will consume all the elements from the vector, leaving it empty after the iteration is done. Amazing! We got a power up! Now I made it spawn in the middle of the screen, that's a little bit weird. So let's instead make it spawn where the ball is that we collided with. We can get the other ball's position by taking its rects and calling the point function. Let's address another issue. If we play the game and all balls get removed, we are stuck. The game should spawn another ball in when all of them are gone. So let's implement that when we lose a life, we will also spawn a ball. The ball position should be right in front of the player. We get the player position and then we push it up to spawn in front of the player. Now we can play the game endlessly. Adding this power up, I discovered a bug. If two balls are removed the same game take, no lives are lost. To fix this, instead we will check that we only lose a life when there are no balls left. That makes more sense. Now we can also remove the debug feature of tapping space to spawn balls. I don't like how the ball doesn't spawn centered to the player, so let's quickly fix that. And that's how you make breakout. If you enjoy Rust content, check out my other videos. The source code for this project is in the description. Thank you very much.